In this session, we're going to look at building an auditorium and time lapse. We're going to first look at project setup using a non SDK, modeling the space, setting up the space in Unity, light mapping, adding light probe, and then refining for the first pass. So the first thing we need to do is create a Mona space. I do this first because then I can import the assets that I create directly into the project rather than sort of creating a separate folder and then importing them again. So I'm just removing a step. So for that, of course, is download the template, upload that into Unity 2022.2.3, and then you have the folder structures you need to import into. I don't really focus on anything else with that. I just need those folders where I want them, and then we can move on. So the first thing we need to do is design our space in our head. Now, what you might want to do with this is create reference using Midjourney or using Google to find the sort of spaces you want. In this case, I actually had an idea of what I wanted to do already. So we sort of focused on that and just started building straight away. So basically take the box and then start building that out into the space that I wanted to create. Now the goal here was basically to focus on a very optimized space and then have a stage at the front with a very large sort of canvas behind it to live stream to. Now unfortunately due to how Unity works with like single threading at the moment, live stream sort of takes up quite a lot of the resources and the frame rate will the frame rate will be reduced because of that. So basically we want the rest of the space to be as optimized as possible to just create a, a smooth experience for everything else. So having like ridiculously high poly counts and material counts. Well, texture file size maybe not as much of a bigger problem, but basically trying to create a very optimized space as much as possible. So the goal here is to basically create an entire space with maybe two or three materials total. One if I can, and I've got some ideas for how to do that, so we'll see how it plays. But basically, the stage at the front, a uh, canvas behind that, and a bunch of steps, so if you have a large group of people, they can sort of still see the stage quite easily. So, very similar to an auditorium. Now, of course, approaching this depends on your ability to build, how much experience you have with Blender or other tools like 3D Studio Max and Maya. And of course, you'll notice that in this process, I'll actually sort of try one approach and then I'll switch it. So I've got like five areas there and it's like, that's kind of too many. So a lot of the creative process is very iterative in that you'll try things sometimes. And if it doesn't work, then you'll just tweak it, edit it, uh, modify it. How you do it depends on what you know. So in this case, I'm just kind of like extruding ones. Now, in halfway up this, and I kind of like how this turned out, is I remembered that a, a seating size, so that the eyes, the, the length of the shin should be about like uh, 45 centimeters, for example. And the lower, the low, lower steps are what you can stand on, which I think is about 25 centimeters. But I actually ended up liking this because like higher up, you sort of have that sort of ramp up, but down and and down below, you can sort of adjust as you see fit. So I actually kind of like the sort of uh, exponential uh, rate of the uh, assets, I guess you could say. Now, this is a, a good example of uh, a change in my mind during the process. So the, the five lines across seemed a bit much. I didn't like it so much. So I decided to merge them to sort of reduce that, but then make a path up to the higher levels uh, because that's kind of how auditoriums work. So the high, higher ups with the seating at 45 need an extra step. So I sort of put that in there with different methods of using uh, Blender to create the tools needed. Now there's many different ways to do it. I use a lot of, uh, what would you call them? Just basic sub D modeling tools. So adding edge loops, uh, one super useful tool in Blender is the F2 add-on. So if you go to uh, Preferences, go down to Add-ons, there's one just called F2 and adding that. So when you have an edge, uh, you can select the vertex, which I do there, just press F and it will sort of put it where you think it should. Um, so that was quite useful in this approach. 
and then just connecting it with F again. So selecting two edges, pressing F to connect those two. And then I started sort of deleting a lot of the uh, edge loops in the space. The poly count is important. Even if you can't see it, Unity can. So you need to sort of reduce the poly count as much as possible. I usually do this with dissolve edges when I delete rather than delete the edge because that just gets rid of the edge itself rather than deletes the whole thing. So finding all the tools that allow you to create your asset um, in a really fast way uh, really helps the process. Uh, and a lot of it comes down to speed, to be honest. So some of it is just being able to do it, and that's the first step, but the second part is how to do it faster. I would probably say that this space took a little bit longer, <clears throat> or this part of the process took a little bit longer because I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do. So the planning stage, if I spent a little bit more time on the planning stage, this would probably be shorter. Every, every project is different. Sometimes you'll have a very clear idea, sometimes you won't, sometimes you'll explore and grow as you do. And I think there's all, all of them are fine depending on the deadline. Um, and that's the key thing there. So one thought that I had with this space was basically making sort of the light. I always like a light glow under a step system or behind a wall, for example, it just looks cool and pretty easy to do with uh, emissive in a space. So sort of creating an underlying element below the step to glow forward uh, with light mapping is a really good way to make something cool uh, kind of quickly. So I do that a lot. Now that I'm watching this, it's quite interesting when you start seeing what you could be doing better or worse. But in this case, you can see that uh, there are a lot of polygons that are getting created just to cleanly close off the steps at the sides. But this might not actually be needed because I could probably do a single plane across the whole wall, which is like two triangles or one polygon in comparison to all the ones there. And to be honest, I, I want to create this as a very optimized space, like as optimized as possible, even if it's just a case of like, what, what does that look like? So for now, this is fine, but I think on the next pass after this whole approach, I'm going to go back and edit this so that the walls there are very small. The catch with this, though, is that light mapping in Unity or using Unity for light mapping uh, does sometimes have leaking issues. So it may not be as accurate because it's sort of trying to figure that space out. So I'll have to do a test. So I'll keep a different version of it and then update it and see if that goes any better. And if so, I've reduced the poly count considerably, which is kind of what we're after. So we'll give that a shot. So once again, using the F tool to connect and add polygons, and then I will clean up the poly count afterwards. Now I covered this recently in a couple of workshops in regards to how to make different assets depending on what you're trying to do. So one of my common approaches is simply having the fact that the poly count is important because I've been making metaverse spaces for a while now. So that's always sort of at the base there. But say, for example, when I was working with characters, I would create a sculpt and not worry about the poly count at all because then I would sort of optimize with retopology and baking, things like that. So I think every asset, every space will depend on what is the result? How many polygons does it have? Uh, or is it allowed to have? How many textures? How big are they? Things like that. So choosing your asset with the target in mind is very important and a very good skill to pick up. But as noted, the workshops with the futuristic sofa uh, cover that in a bit more detail. So check them out. Now notice here what I've done is you see a big red thing. Now that's using, uh, what is it called? Face orientation in the top right viewport tool. What that means is red in Unity would be see-through. So if I, if the camera was outside the space where it is here, then you would actually see the, the floor and the walls, but you wouldn't see the ceiling. A blue on the other hand is solid. So you would see all of the elements there. So the normal, of a polygon is very important in game engines because generally speaking you will only have one-sided materials so a face orientation is very useful there at this point i'm sort of adding materials so i just want two 
one for glow and one for material. Now, eventually, I'm probably going to change this because I want to like make the walls a little bit more interesting, but it's a good place to get started to get a feel for the space and the size and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then I come back and fix all that up. Now, I'll probably end up doing a trim sheet approach to this, so I could have like two or three materials on one or two or three texture types on one material. So that is a very optimized approach to that. So we'll be looking at that as well. Now in Unity, I'm making the materials. So I have my glow and I have my sort of primary color. Um, lately, I've been using that sort of naming as a personal choice. So primary, secondary, and tertiary colors. Uh, it's a good way sort of design to play around with the color approaches. Imported the assets and then applied those two textures to the object. And then I'm just adding some portals. Um, if anyone ever, uh, like links to this space they can sort of teleport or arrive at the doors instead of the spawn point which is kind of a better way to do it so the next thing i need to do is because the floors aren't exactly good for simple box colliders i'm going to create a me mesh collider base so i don't want all the polygons that the space has i definitely want to simplify this so basically I'll go back to Blender and create a very simple version where the model is aligned to where I would want the avatar to walk and that's all. Uh, so basically I'm cleaning up a lot of the polygons here uh, to make sure it's as simple as possible and then using that mesh as the collider base. Uh, this is very important uh, for high polygon assets especially uh, but even this one I'm going to simplify quite a fair bit just to make sure that it's a much simpler asset. In the transition between the two, so Unity and then uh, Blender, for example, I'll bounce between the two as I'm designing the space. I'll figure out things that I can improve or maybe the scale is a bit off. So a lot of the time in that building the space process, I'll jump between Blender and Unity quite a lot because I'll find things in Unity that I didn't see in Blender, or I'll think of something that uh, is better to do after I see it in action kind of things. And sometimes that'll apply to assets that I'll make in... Like, I, w I won't make that decision until I have run around the space, like get check the playground files and see what it's like as uh, an avatar running around in that maybe the steps are too big, maybe the uh, space is too small, because what you think it is and what it feels in a space is very different. And that changes again if you're doing the VR or mobile, like all of these feel different. So making sure that your end goal has it right makes a big difference in regards to the overall experience. Now you'll notice here, this is where I add the mesh collider for the optimized mesh that I put in and then expand the collider model to get the mesh that is underneath it. So, and then just drag that into the mesh collider component. That said, um, I think I actually liked the feel of the space. I think the size of it's pretty good. You could get 30 to 40 people in there pretty comfortably. So I think the overall size of the space was good. Now, at this point, we're looking at putting a canvas in. So this is for the live streaming or even an image if need be. So I actually changed the ratio to 0.16 and 0.09 to sort of get the 16.9 because most videos, most live streams, most screens are that sort of ratio. So that's how I sort of got around that and then just scale it up. Uh, note how I scaled the the asset that has artifact on it, not the overall canvas. Uh, there are some problems that happen when you scale the artifact itself. After that, I start looking at lighting. Uh, and this is with light mapping in, in mind. So I realize that uh, light will bounce and things will be brighter. I also have all the glow under the, the seats and stuff, and that will add a fair bit of light to it as well. I want the stage to be more lit, more of a focus. And you'll notice that the, the spotlight sort of stopped working. Uh, to fix that, you can sort of tweak the, how important the asset is, and then it'll show the light correctly. 
Uh, so if you're doing lots of light mapping um, and those lights are not going to be real time and it's doing that, that's one way around that. I don't think I actually use any real time lights in this space. Once again, I'm trying to get it very optimized, very easy to run on pretty much any system and real time lights with shadows especially will cost a fair bit. So I'm actually not going to put any of that in and focus a bit more on light probes. So the file size will get a bit bigger because there's a lot of light uh, information either in the textures or the, the light probes, but it doesn't matter that much for that case because it's a very small space and not something I really have to worry about. So adding some spotlights to the stage and then uh, seeing how it looks with the rest. So you get there. Unfortunately, light mapping does take a while. But you sort of start getting a feel for it as well. You have to play with all of the settings. I will usually turn the settings down if it's a complicated space because the light mapping will take some time. Uh, on my computer, I'll have a range from an hour and a half for some spaces to like the five to ten minutes with simple ones. So it depends on the computer you have what's the settings that you've got in the light mapping uh, situation and adjust as needed. Now, usually the start especially is more about how it feels, not so much how it looks. I can always make it look better, but the feeling of it is like, how does the glow work? What does that look like? Is it remotely good? And then come back to cleaning things up, changing the blender uh, assets, and then those sort of things. So it's definitely to and from. So we have our space, looks pretty good. The quality of the light map is a bit, like you can see the, what would you call it? It's a bit messy, <laughs> I'll say that much. But that's because the resolution was limited and all that sort of stuff, so that's fine. Once again, getting a feel for the space rather than the final results, because there's still a lot of things that I want to do overall. So I think overall this looks pretty good. Happy with the general size of the space. Like if you have 10 people, you could be all up the front, but if you have 50, that would be actually quite nice. The stage seems maybe a little bit small uh, for the size of the, the room, so I might make that bigger. The lighting seems pretty accurate. I It's a little dark perhaps, uh, but I could look at that. So these sort of things become more prominent when you're actually walking around the space. So it's a good habit to get into the space as soon as possible and test regularly so you can get a good feel for the space. Next up, you'll have the light probes. Light probes are very important for light mapped spaces because the dynamic objects in the space, in which includes the avatar, need to be lit by something. And if you have a real time light, which with this one doesn't, then the avatars would be completely black. So the light probes are very, very important for creating a more accurate representation of light for dynamic objects such as characters, or animated objects if you are light mapping the space. So if you're light mapping, you should add light probes. So basically what's happening is when you, when you do the light mapping or bake the lights, each of these little dots that I'm placing in the space will take a piece of that information, that lighting information, and the dynamic objects will be lit by that color. So uh, it adds a little bit to the file size, but saves a lot in regards to overall processing for objects that are moving around and things like that. So lighting will always basically be sort of like a battle, especially in a WebGL space, which has limited resources between your real-time lights and your dynamic objects. And light probes will be a big part of that. So once again, I'll add the light mapping then. I think I tweaked some of the, the settings but basically, it's always the same, the same thing. Add, once I get a feel for exactly where I want the lighting to be, and it looks good, uh, before you finish, then you can do it another uh, time. Unfortunately, I, I get in the habit of creating light maps way too often. Uh, one, of the, one of my favorite uh, quotes of like the development pipeline is basically trust the process. So I know what it's going to look like, but I want to see it better. <laughs> <laughs> before I uh, continue on different things such as materials and things like that. And the lighting is going to change because light looks different on wood in comparison to on metal and all those sort of things. 
but for some reason I, I just like seeing the result and feeling more confident that I'm in the right direction. So I will light map way too often. But then you also get something a bit better to work with. And also I'm checking with the, the light probes if if those are set correctly and, and things like that for the character when they're running around. So kind of a win, but yeah, I don't I didn't I don't need to. <laughs> I just should. So light mapping, uh, basically you put the dots where light changes. If there's not much light change in your space, you don't need many light probes. Uh, so there's very much different approaches to it. But if, you're, if your lighting has a sort of like very light areas and very dark areas, then you would use light probes in those areas correctly to sort of get that build, for example. So once again, there's no real-time lights in this space, to my knowledge, um, but the character is lit. And once they get on the stage, you'll see that it's a bit lighter. So light, light probes are super important. So the last thing I do here is just add a collider onto the stage. I didn't add this into the optimized mesh of the auditorium, for example, because that was easy to get in there. And that would be it for the first pass. Like, I think it's it's the right lighting, nearly. The space feels kind of correct, so I can definitely start working with that. And then we can start looking at the next phase of sort of refinement. <laughs>